Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jody Schwan. Uh, hey, congratulations. You almost made it through the week, Thursday afternoon. Uh, it's been another memorable one, I know, on our end for sure. I want to thank you for joining us all throughout this week. We have been so fortunate to have such a wonderful lineup of newsmakers joining us for our video Q&As, and we have a great one coming up for you today with uh, DSU President Jose Marie Griffiths. Uh, very excited to bring her in. If you are just uh, catching up on the news today, uh, we've had a lot of it once again, so head over to www.sufalls.business. You can always check our overall COVID-19 update story. We keep that updated all throughout the day. If you want to check on what's happening with case numbers, today we got our weekly unemployment figures in. We've got the uh, final CDC report on Smithfield Foods that has a number of recommendations for them that uh, they will be working to implement prior to reopening. And then I think we've just got some really great, unique, original stories on the site today. And without giving too much away, keep watching because um, we've got a story that's going to come out later today that uh, I just think is such a terrific one in so many ways, and uh, I can't wait to share that with you. But uh, without further delay, I am going to uh, bring in Dr. Griffiths at DSU. Hi, thanks so much for being with me. Hi there. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Well, we have so much to talk about. Um, you know, Dr. Griffiths is such a resource for us, uh, really statewide, and, and certainly at DSU. And uh, I just can't wait to hear everything that has been happening there. You know, beginning with the preparation, and uh, we have a, a piece that is, if it's not on our site yet, it's going to be on our site, that really takes a deeper dive into how DSU got ready for all of this. Um, but pandemic planning and, and emergency response and crisis management is not new to, to Dr. Griffiths. So, uh, and she has a great federal and, and, and national, even international perspective on all of this. So uh, why don't you talk me through, Dr. Griffiths, um, how COVID-19 first appeared on your radar when uh, and what you began doing in preparation uh, for leading DSU through all of this. Well, thanks. Yes, I think it first came to my attention in very early January, and I started having conversation with a couple of people on campus, uh, mainly because um, we've had these before. We had the SARS outbreak and, and various other outbreaks, and that we've always had to be prepared, um, regardless of, uh, you know, waiting for it to actually hit our shores. And so I started talking about then as it became clear that this was becoming a much more serious issue than uh, people might have thought initially. The first thing uh, we did was we started to meet regularly as a cabinet, that's the leadership of the university, starting to meet uh, daily. And we established a task force which involved a lot more people across the campus to really start planning for various contingencies, the what ifs, if you like. You don't want to start planning when it's time to take action. So our aim was to think about various scenarios, to model what we would need to do, what information we need, who would need to get it, how we would handle certain situations, so that at the time when the governor uh, issued her uh, work from home order, we were on our extended spring break and we were able to move very, very swiftly into uh, a work from home and a fully online um, delivery of all our courses. Uh, so it went very, very easily. You know, I have to think that DSU's foundation and all things cyber uh, has to help. It's kind of part of the DNA and part of the culture there. As, as all of us are discovering Zoom and Teams and webcams and all this, this is nothing new. You could probably build this software over there if you had to. So, um, you know, how has the, the culture of DSU helped you along the way, do you think? Well, that certainly helped. I mean, not only does every student have a laptop that uh, we, we give them um, as part of their program, but uh, all of our faculty and staff are very, very comfortable in working with technology. What we had to do for our um, staff was uh, get them to not only have access to the computers to do their work, but to make sure that they had accessible files once they were actually off campus. So that became a part of the issue. And then uh, we went through a process of looking at what they might need to do to sort of protect their, their home networks from um, cy cyber thieves and <laughs> to make sure that we had a safe environment for everybody to conduct the work. So we've been involved in um, distance education, online education for decades. Um, but there were some faculty who hadn't yet taught online, but there again, we had experienced faculty who could step up and help them think through how they might deliver their course a little bit differently. So everybody jumped in. Um, it was a pretty comprehensive approach to planning and preparation. 
And then uh, we, uh, we made sure that we reached out and talked with public safety and we talked with Madison Regional Health and just generally knew what, uh, what other people were doing in the community. Viewers, I want to invite you to ask your questions of Dr. Griffiths. If we've got some students, some faculty, some alumni out there, uh, please tell us who you are. I'm sure she would love to hear that. And if you do have questions of her, go ahead and write those in the comments. But we always like to know who is watching these and would love to know what you're wondering about too. So uh, I'll transition now because this has been a number of weeks that you've been doing the online learning. How's it going? And do you have any particular examples of maybe where it's been particularly effective? Um, well, I, I, as I say, it was a pretty smooth transition to online course delivery. Um, we had a situation uh, where one of our students was um, living in a state where that issued a stay at home order and he had not he didn't have internet access in, in the place where he was living. He'd gone to see a relative to use his uh, network. So we did have a couple of instances where students didn't have access to the internet and we had to find ways around that. But generally, I think we our, our transition was smooth. I'll tell you one of the interesting things, one of the areas where we had a little bit of um, work to do in preparation was in uh, uh, high tech, you know, very high tech uh, courses where we give students access to these highly special specialized um, state-of-the-art equipment in labs, such as the animation labs. And the question was, how do we deliver that, that key high-level functionality to our students in a remote way? And so I know that our IT personnel jumped in, worked with faculty to find out how they could do that. They actually had to talk to the software developer to come up with a solution on delivering that capability across the internet to people at home. These are things that we don't necessarily think about. Uh, so obviously, lots of adapting on the fly. But you know, so much innovation coming out of DSU too. We had a terrific look at that um, through a partnership that you had with the hospital there in Madison, as well as a, a local company that was able to respond really swiftly to some needs. Talk yes. me through how that all came together. Well, you know, I really do think that part of the culture at DSU is not just the use of technology, but it's an approach to looking at the world. It's an approach to identifying problems and finding ways to tease apart a problem, look at the various components, and then try things out and put it together and come up with a solution. Uh, that's a lot of what we teach. We teach that way. Um, but uh, it was one of our faculty members, Justin Blessinger, who, who is also director of the Adaptive Technology Lab in the Mad Labs, who had had some conversation with Madison Regional Health, identified a problem, started to look at how he might be able to help with the fabrication of face masks and was looking around and finding what various other people had, had made available in the way of designs. And he started working with the designs and then realized that um, the problem with face masks is they our faces aren't all the same. And face masks, in order to work, have to fit very closely to a person's face. And so a lot of people need a sm smaller size than the more traditional ones that are available. So he got to work um, starting to look at how he could design something that would work at the smaller scale. And then his colleague, um, Tom Halverson, started looking at the uh, a couple of the printers, the 3D printers that were having problems. And we got our uh, president of the Student Senate involved and they fixed the 3D printers. So now we had multiple printers. But it was very, very clear that um, Justin and the work that he was doing couldn't keep up with the demand. And so he came up with the idea of going and talking with Global Polymer here in Madison, who have an injection molding capability that would allow the production of um, face masks to increase from about eight, eight per day printed on a 3D printer to about 400 a day with the injection molding process. So it was, um, it's, it's sort of a very innovative approach to looking at a problem, jumping in, not accepting the first solution, and then uh, finding someone who could really help make it happen even faster. Are they still producing those, do you know? Uh, I really am not sure. I haven't caught up with that. Everyone was very busy. Um, I assume that Global Polymer is still doing some of the work. Okay, yeah, I mean, just really neat to see those examples occurring. Uh, at a very mm -hmm. grassroots level. Are there additional, do you think, research opportunities or applications um, to everything that the pandemic is bringing? I've enjoyed going through the Mad Labs a couple times, and it, it just seems like there's so much potential there, really, no matter where you look. But do you see anything obvious coming out of this situation? Well, well actually, the, um, the pandemic has given um, 
uh, hackers an opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, so in fact, there has been um, a lot, lot of increase in cybercrime. And so that's a great portion of the kinds of work that we do. So helping people build much, much more robust and resilient uh, networks and um, capabilities is going to be important going forward. I think we'll learn from this experience how to ensure that when we're not working on campus, where we have a lot of protection with firewalls and so on, um, when you're at home uh, doing your work, um, and I'm sure we're going to see more people doing work for home, not necessarily full time, but more people will work for home. So how can we ensure that those are secure environments for the kinds of records and activities that we're engaged in? So that's one kind of research. I think the other kind of research is really related to the whole uh, social interaction uh, piece of what we do. Um, the the side of not the technology, but how technology can really help bring us together rather than unnecessarily drive us apart. And how do you bring uh, and sustain, build and sustain community in a technological environment? Um, I, think, I think that's working very well and it's particularly acute here because quite frankly, all of our social structures, all of our social interaction structures have sort of fallen apart. Um, you know, some of us might have gone to recreational athletics events, some of us would go to musical concerts, some of us would go to civic organizations, um, some of us would have various, uh, you know, community friends in the community we get together with periodically, and those have broken down to some extent, they can be replaced by the, uh, the, the ubiquitous Zoom or GoToMeetings or whichever platform you're using, but I think we'll, I really do believe we've developed a much healthier respect for not only the capabilities of technology to bring us together, but also the importance of social interaction, particularly as these days of being uh, socially distant or staying at home or working from home seem to be sort of dragging on for some people. I, I sense a certain level of cabin fever among people. There's a little fatigue with it too, I think, even this remote work environment. So I'm yes. gonna ask you this, I think you'd be a great person to ask this question to because I think a number of business leaders, I'm hearing from them, um, they're struggling a little bit with how to manage most effectively when their leadership team is all remote. You know, what are some strategies that work for you? What kind of advice would you give them? Well, we get together still um, on a regular basis. We, we, get, we get together on a regular basis with our team, but we've also been um, creating some, some shorter check-ins. Um, so the vice, um, Angie Kaplan, the vice president for human resources and I ha have a series of meetings where we drop in with a group of our employees for half an hour and just say, how's it going? What's working well? What isn't working well? What, what might you suggest that uh, we can do to help or that we can share with others that is, is particularly good for you? Angie and her, her team has been very creative in thinking up some of the more fun things to do. Um, you know, we forget about these more casual interactions we have in the workplace. You might run across the street and grab a cup of coffee, bump into a few people, have a conversation. We can't do that anymore. So I do think that um, we're going to have to think about how we create these interactions and how important those interactions are for us to feel part of a community, for us to be comfortable so that we can be productive when we do work, and for us to understand the balance between our work life and our and our home lives. I think all of those are things that we've learned out of this experience. You had a good example. Remind me what it's called. DSU Talks is what sticks in, in my head, but it was uh, an <laughs> ongoing check-in. How does that work and, and what are you doing with that? We have, well, we have check-ins, but every Friday afternoon we have a What's Up DSU. That's it. What's Up DSU. And What's Up DSU is an open session. Uh, we've had, um, typically we have anywhere from 130 to 160 people uh, joining us in a Zoom environment. We ask for questions up front um, and then people can submit questions during the session. Um, usually I start and give an update on what's happening. So um, in uh, tomorrow's session, I'm going to let people know what our survey of, of seniors, of graduating seniors, um, returned in terms of their preferences for commencement. So tomorrow we'll talk about what we're going to do for commencement, um, assuming we can be back at some point during the fall semester. Um, but so as we, I've also been interacting on a regular basis at one point every day. Now we're down to two or three times a week with the presidents of the regental universities. And we talk about our issues 
um, and what we might do together when we might work, work, make decisions that are consistent with each other and where we have local differences. And those, I usually bring reports from those interactions as well to the campus community. So it's just a way of, uh, you know, we do have the regular um, DS update, which goes out every Friday, but we want it to be more personal, personable and actually touch base with people where they can see us, they can hear us, um, you know, we can be a little bit more interactive. Yeah, I just thought that was a great approach to communication. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, you alluded to this in, in your last response, but you know, how hard is it to plan? I mean, you, you alluded to the fact if, if we're back in the fall, I mean, what kind of contingency planning are you doing? Obviously, I'm sure it's hard to have certainty around anything, but uh, what is that whole process looking like uh, as we sit here today and going on late April? Well, we have um, we have uh, two task forces um, set up. One task force is looking at what what happens when we come back, when we're able to come back. What do we need to put in place uh, for that? For example, if we're going to have people come back to campus, can we have everyone come back to campus, or do we have to distance people? And what are we going to do with people who are still at risk? Because this is not going to go away. Um, so how do we cope with those kinds of situations? And then we've got another group saying, what if we can't come back? Um, what are the different things we have to take into consideration uh, going forward? So we're just just really um, into that a few weeks. It's um, intense. There are lots of issues that we have to think about, lots of preparations we have to make once we've made decisions. So what we've been doing is looking at the key decision points. Now we're starting to look at the options for each decision. And then, of course, we'll be coordinating with the other institutions around the state. It just takes a long time. But this uh, scenario planning, this uh, planning for these kinds of large scale changes, something that I've had some experience with when I was still in England, I did a fair amount of uh, uh, scenario planning. Um, we, I, was, I was working with a defense company and so we were looking at different defense kinds of situations, attacks coming from different parts of the world. So that was my early training and we did a lot of that with the military. But when I was in the United, since I've been in the United States, when I was in North Carolina, I uh, was one of the founders of what's called the North Carolina Center for Biopreparedness. Exactly this situation. We worked with the CDC. We worked with hospitals around around the state. We worked with the State Department of Health. We worked with pharmacies, with veterinary uh, offices, and we gathered a tremendous amount of information that would help us not only tell uh, after the fact that uh, that we'd had some kind of epidemic, but in fact to gather new kinds of information that would allow us to get involved in the identification of um, an epidemic much, much sooner in the process. It doesn't really help if you, after the fact, just say, yes, we had an epidemic and we couldn't do anything about it. So the idea was then, how do you bring all these different groups in a state together to start planning? So I use that expertise as I was informed in early January that um, there was this strange thing going on in China and we really didn't know how, how fast or how far it would spread and we just started planning. And I, I, it doesn't matter what happens, even if we come back at the end of August and every, everything goes back to quote normal, all of the planning that we're doing for not coming back can just go into our stack of preparedness for the future for any kind of incident coming coming at us. Right. Well, that's fascinating. I did not realize that uh, you had that level of background and who would have thought that you would have such real world applications for that uh, later in your career? You never know what you have, uh, what you've learned from somewhere and how, how it can be applied to another situation. Uh, anything else that you would just like to add here before I let you go? Anything else that uh, people have been asking you about or you would just like to get out there to the broader business community? I think, I think my main theme is that everybody thinks about Dakota State as a technology related uh, environment. And we're very, very good at the technology, but all the technology in the world isn't going to help you if your people are not comfortable and find a way to be able to be productive. And so the people side of it, the people element, the human element is as important as the use of technology and one's comfort in using technology. And I think that's the message that I, that I want to put out. Um, and we have to pay attention to both. And the core, the core is um, communication, communication, and more communication. Um, we got to the point where we had um, an emergency operations center set up here 
Uh, I was in it every day from the day, time I arrived, usually around seven until six, five, six at night. We went at it. We got messages ready. We consistently put out messages. And I thought maybe we're communicating too much. But the good news we heard back from, the, uh, from our staff was we feel informed. We feel as though we have a sense of what's going on. We know you don't have all the answers. We know there are difficult decisions, but we feel informed. And that was so important to us that we were thinking maybe we're over communicating. I'm not sure that you ever can over communicate. No, I would agree with that, especially at a time when there is so much uncertainty, which then breeds anxiety and a lack of productivity generally when that occurs. Exactly. No, terrific um, advice and, and wisdom to share. Always so good catching up with you. Thanks again Thanks. for uh, joining me on this. Um, and as I mentioned, if you would like to read a detailed version of how DSU prepared and is responding to the pandemic, you can find that over at uh, Sioux Falls Stop Business. We'll put that, this video uh, in that piece as well. Dr. Griffiths, thanks again. Uh, we'll stay in touch with you and with your team and hopefully update uh, with you again here in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks very much, Jody, And thank you for your column. It's always very interesting to catch up on your COVID-19 column. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reading. I appreciate that as well, uh, as we do all of you. Thank you so much uh, for continuing to, uh, to read our work. We've had just an unbelievable audience response here, uh, really all this year, frankly, before the pandemic, yeah. but certainly as we've been, uh, you know, trying to tackle as much breaking news as we can and, and still bring you some of those business related items. I don't think you'll see anything else. So thanks very much okay. for watching. Thank you. Uh, we thanks. will be back with you uh, next week. I don't, I don't know that we're going to have a live video tomorrow. We might, you never know anymore. Um, but for sure next week, we've got a full uh, lineup of very interesting interviews. We look forward to that. In the meantime, send you over to Sioux Falls Stop Business to catch up on uh, all your, uh, your daily and your ongoing business. Thanks very much. Uh, have a good day. Hey, and we'll talk to you again.